And we are live. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the PSBTA Technical Solutions Webinar Series. My name is Martha Ellis, and I'm the Executive Director for the Public Safety Broadband Technology Association, or the PSBTA. As an association, our primary objective is to work as an end user advocate for all primary and extended primary FirstNet users. This includes all first responders and service providers who support response, mitigation, and recovery efforts during emergencies. We've created this webinar series in an effort to bring you the most current and accurate information on all aspects of broadband use for public safety personnel, including the latest developments in technology specific to the ecosystem. Today's webinar is the eighth in our AT&T Lean In series, specifically designed to not only showcase the network, but many of the FirstNet approved applications that can be found in the FirstNet app catalog. The FirstNet built with AT&T Lean In webinars are all about helping you optimize the FirstNet network, assuring the highest level of preparedness and reliable communications. If you've missed any of the previous presentations, please feel free to visit thepsbta.org to watch the archived webinars. A few housekeeping items before we get started. All attendees have automatically been muted to reduce background noise. Any questions should be submitted directly to us through the questions function, which is located at the bottom of the menu on the right side of your screen. Questions will be answered at the end of our presentations, and we will attempt to answer as many questions as possible yet stay within our allotted hour. We will follow up with any questions that do not get answered during the live portion of the webinar after we finish today. If you have further questions when the webinar is over, we will also provide the emails of the preventer, pre, uh, pre, presenters at the end so you can follow up at your convenience. Also in the panel to the right of your screen, I'd like to point out that there are handouts available that should be downloaded prior to the conclusion of the webinar. Today's first responders deal with complex situations every day. They train regularly to assure the highest level of preparedness for any number of possible response needs. Yet, for as prepared as the first responder is to help others, all too often they are less inclined to ask for help themselves. Today we'll be discussing ways that FirstNet is working with wellness specialists to assure first responders can take care of the most important tool on the rig, themselves. Our presenters today are Anna Curry, Lead Channel Manager, FirstNet AT&T, Mike Bostic, Director for FirstNet Strategy and Policy, Janelle Farr, President for All Clear Foundation, and Rhonda Kelly, Director of GMR Life. Through personal experience, rigorous study, and purposeful program and app development, this team will show first responders how the potential help they need is right at their fingertips. With that, I will turn the time over to Anna to get us started with our, our webinar, Incorporating Responder Wellness into the FirstNet app ecosystem. Thanks so much, Martha. I really appreciate being here today. Uh, good afternoon, good morning, everyone. My name is Dr. Anna Corey, and I am the new manager for Responder Wellness with AT&T. AT&T is committed to standing up a program to address Responder Wellness, and today I'd like to touch on some of those efforts that we're gonna be sharing with you. I think we all know that the mental, physical, and spiritual demands of public safety is pretty well documented. Uh, the rates of PTSD, depression, anxiety, stress, burnout, they're above the national average. And first responders are often asked to do more with less every single day. So one of the goals of FirstNet Health and Wellness is to support responder well-being by leveraging those AT&T capabilities to put the tools in your hands that allow you to take care of your health and wellness as a part of your job, as well as part of the app ecosystem. So what we're doing with our commitment to health and wellness is developing an organizational strategy that's going to see how AT&T can enhance your health and wellness as a part of the FirstNet. And one arm of that strategy incorporates identifying digital applications that support first responder health and wellness and vet them through the FirstNet app ecosystem so that you can have those applications available on your FirstNet device. Now, in addition to first, the FirstNet applications, we're also looking at browser-based resources that can support holistic wellness. And so that's what we're gonna be talking about today. One of the apps that we've identified is the Responder Relate application, and one of the browser-based tools is Responder Strong. You're gonna hear more about them in depth today from their developers. But before we get started, we wanted to set the stage with real life stories of responders, health, wellness, and how it's impacted them. And so I'm pleased to introduce to you, Mr. Mike Bostic. He's a former law enforcement officer with the LAPD and now works with FirstNet in the public sector 
um, division. And he has volunteered to come talk to us today about his experience as a public safety official and the importance of health and wellness to his habits, his team, and how you may apply that to taking care of yourself today. Mike, the floor is yours. Thank you, Anna. So I'm a retired assistant chief in the LAPD. I was there for 34 years. And uh, during my career there, we had many incidences, the riots and lots of other things that led to all kinds of officer stress in our organization. We also had a professional organization called the Behavioral Science Services Organization within the LAPD. And those of you in public safety know how much we trust internal help. Not much. It's just the nature of who we are. But I want to talk about one incident in particular. When I was the chief of the San Fernando Valley on February 28, 1997, I was in downtown LA at a staff meeting with all my fellow chiefs and commanders. And they were actually singing happy birthday to me because it was February 28, 97, and that's my birthday. And while we were singing happy birthday, all of a sudden, every phone, every radio, everything went off. And for those of you who were around in that time, you'll remember the North Hollywood uh, Bank of America shooting in which Larry Phillips and Emil Montessoreno were armed from head and toe with, with uh, weapons and guns in their car. Their, they had body armor. They were hopped up on drugs. And they came out of the bank firing. And in the ensuing gun battle, uh, we were trying to fight fully automatic rifles and machine guns with Smith & Wesson 38s and Beretta 9 millimeters and a few 12-gauge shotguns. And all of us saw the film, 42 minutes of just plain stark terror is the best way to describe it. And 33 officers on the LAPD fired rounds during that incident, over 1,580 rounds. So in the course of that, the LAPD does what a lot of agencies do, and we investigate the officer-involved shootings, and we discuss every round as to whether or not it was in policy, training, and all of those things. So this was a unique situation. So I had the honor and the privilege of representing all of those officers involved in that shooting at the use of force board and so i got to interview each of them for about a half a day of peace and walk the scene with them and hear their emotions and feel the anxieties that they felt the fears that they felt the fear that they felt from the organization and what the organization was going to do because most of their rounds were out of policy from any normal shooting because it was not a normal shooting they were just firing to, to try to save each other's lives the best way they could with weapons they were not prepared to deal with. The larger tragedy of that was we had uh, 11 officers injured in that shooting, none killed, thank God. The only two that passed away were uh, the suspects. And I can just imagine that court battle. So it was a blessing in Los Angeles. We didn't have to go through all of that. So the biggest tragedy was over time, Many of those officers became close friends. You, you, you can't go through that kind of a traumatic incident, spend that kind of time with them and not become close friends in the process. They did not trust the behavioral science system inside the LAPD any more than any other agency does because, as we all know, nothing is anonymous in an anonymous organization. And that's just the way life is. Nothing is anonymous in a company even when they say it is. And we all know that and we don't trust it. So I'm really excited to talk about some of the apps we're going to talk about today, because I think that might have changed the outcome for 10 of the officers out of the 33 that never came back to policing. And it wasn't because of their injuries. It was because of their, of their mental state and what happened during the course of that shooting for them personally and the aftermath. They just decided that police work was no longer for them. And it, that's a sad strategy because they were clearly heroes who were willing to take on anything, and they did, and they didn't come back. And I'm just looking forward to some of the things we're going to talk about today, peer-to-peer -to -peer apps and the ability to actually talk to somebody anonymously about what's going on in your life. And so I'm going to turn it over now to Janelle Farr, who is the Executive Director of the CLEAR Foundation, and she's going to start talking about some of the possibilities that are coming on the FirstNet Public Safety Network. Thanks, Mike. Sorry about that, guys. Struggling with uh, some mute buttons. Um, I want one second. Oh, 
I want to make sure I can everyone see hopefully by my screen here. Um, I um, like like Mike said first. I'm uh, Janelle Farr with All Clear Foundation. I want to thank Anna and Mike and the entire AT and T and FirstNet team for having Rhonda and I um, here to present to you Responders Relate and the You Responder Strong programs. One is more of a uh, kind of peer empowerment app and the other is an individual empowerment uh, tool for responders. And like Mike said, you know, it gives everyone and enables them to to explore personal experiences or get information for others in the case of the app um, by being anonymous if you choose. Um, but I thought I'd go over a little bit about All Clear Foundation and how we got here today first. Sure. All right. So the question when we started All Clear Foundation in 2018 was, how do we positively impact the lives of the 3 million plus active and um, retired, injured out, former first responders in this country, um, and as well as their families who support them and who, uh, you know, every day sacrifice uh, in the background on their behalf, and how, how could we possibly do that? And we didn't see any real national efforts that were happening. Tons of organizations locally were doing really, really incredible things. Um, all of them, you know, doing it, uh, you know, kind of a little bit in isolation, and how could we do something and build something bigger to where we could support not only those organizations, but democratize the resources for all responders. And so our answer to that was to build a really collaborative national foundation where we can, you know, create, fund, and amplify programs that are really focused on the improving the life expectancy and well-being of first responders. And so we kind of started talking to responders throughout the country and uh, really looked at a lot of studies and you know tried to find out you know what should we tackle first and the, the statistics were just daunting um and, and it really seemed not very hopeful it just seemed like it was something that was going to be you know so insurmountable to to tackle but then we started to talk more and more to more and more people and experts in the field that were really focused on solving these issues and we found that for most of these you know, even though they're daunting, these statistics are changeable. And there are solutions out there, but they need time, attention, and money put into them in order to build them out, not only for an individual department, but for responders across the entire country. And so how could we do this at scale? And so we really started taking a look at all the experts that we talked to, collaborating with them, pairing it with technology so that we could get scalable support and really, taking inputs from throughout the industry, specialists, technology pioneers, you know, obviously the first responders and their employees, associations and unions, you, you name it. And, and we thought we had this good, better, best model. You know, if, if best was something that was in person, but 98% of the responders in the country couldn't get that, we need to build something that's good or better, right? So that's when the technology came in. And our focus is really, um, on mental, emotional, physical, and physiological, family, and social, and spiritual, really the entire holistic well-being, um, we call it a totality of wellness for responders, but the real big cry out was mental wellness, um, and we know that that obviously impacts the physiological elements of a responder as well, um, but, but that was kind of a lot of the focus. People were really interested in in working to de decrease suicide and post-traumatic stress and, and the like. And so the insights really that led to the creation of Responder Relate, um, which was heavily actually informed by our next speaker, Rhonda, who, who educated us quite a bit on this, was that peer support programs are incredibly effective for a wide variety, you know, not just the negative, but for a wide variety of things that, that responders go through. And you know, we know from the Harvard study that everybody has surely um, already heard about that social connection improves both physical and mental health. But the challenge was that formal peer support programs weren't widely available, and especially not for rural volunteer or retired responders. Um, and I would include family, you know, as well. There wasn't a, a really great way for them to connect about their shared experiences with having, you know, their responders um, out in the field. We also know that feelings of isolation um, or that you're the only one that has experienced a particular issue can lead to a downward spiral um, 
Or, you know, on the positive side, if you're looking to for increased career growth or, you know, increase your fitness, if you don't have those right connections to figure out, there's just some missed opportunities for personal or professional growth. And so our potential solution was that if we can connect with someone who's been there and done that, that it can normalize the experience, right? That the people can learn from other folks with personal testimonials of how to get through or achieve whatever the responder is trying to tackle from weight issues to depression, um, from dealing with wildland fires and the stresses of that to, you know, really wanting to pr improve their relationship with their family. And so we have uh, in the app, there, there are a wide variety of topics that I'll, I'll show you in, in a moment. We also have, know that connecting at the early stages of something that's potentially negative and really making that connection earlier with those folks that have also gone through and come through some of those situations, that it can keep responders from escalating along the stress continuum or having the negative physiological impacts of all of the increased stress and increased cortisol um, and, and keep them in the green or yellow zone instead of you know expanding uh, through the continuum and God forbid suicide. So that was really the impetus for how can we create some, something that, um, you know, if the formal peer support programs aren't universally available, then how can we find a way that, they, that responders can support each other in an informal way where they can connect and, you know, not, not knowing, and I, I will widely admit this is not formal peer support, it is responders talking to responders anonymously if they choose so that they can support each other through shared experiences. And so we built Responder Relate, the peer-to-peer -peer chat app. Um, it's only for responders. I, we also, I, anonymous if you choose to be, many people choose not to be anonymous. We've seen people recognize each other in the app and, hey, I haven't talked to you in a while and things like that. But for some folks, they, they might want to be anonymous. And so you just make sure that you have a, you know, a screen name that doesn't identify you. Um, and then it's available 24-7. It's an app. It's available on your phone whenever you need it. You could be on the job and, you know, taking a break and be in it. You could be sitting, you know, in a rig next to your partner on a break and them not know what you're actually texting about. So this is Responder Relate. Again, I said it's only for responders. There are, you can see in the middle screen, there are quite a lot of different chat rooms. We have over 70, uh, probably too many, but we're in the early stages. We've launched widely at the end of April. Um, and so we're looking for the activity that's in those rooms and find out if some can be either collapsed or moved over. And so we're still in the middle of, of all that analysis. And you'll look on the right side, it's just a, an opportunity for folks to jump in and support one another. We've had really, really great um, success already from, and, and I've had contacts from responders with depression who uh, didn't know really what to do, felt it in isolation. Their, their wife knew about it. They were on medication, had been diagnosed for three years, had a conversation in this app with other folks um, who had depression, they had a discussion about medication, some folks made a, you know, a recommendation for things that worked for them. The gentleman talked to his uh, doctor about it. They changed the medication because the doctor thought that that was a, a good recommendation. And we're, you know, several months later, because he was one of our early testers, um, and he said his entire life has changed. He's actually sat down and talked to his family, his kids, about the fact that he was diagnosed with depression three years ago, and this wasn't their fault. Everything that was going on in the house was about his depression and his challenges with the job as a detective, um, and it made their family tighter knit. So those are the kind of stories that someone who felt isolated, felt alone, was a detective in a very small rural department, thought nobody else was going through what he was going through, and why could he not handle the stressors of the job. It was what he was there to do. Um, but we all know that the trauma that one sees in responder work is not normal, right? It's, and we need to normalize it. And we need to not only focus on some of the intervention tools that we do in crisis, but giving folks a way to talk to people to keep them out of crisis. If we can connect folks early on when they are struggling or when they, you know, they might be wanting to go up, like I said earlier, for 
a promotion, but they may not talk to somebody or their partner in, the, in a department because they might be up against that particular person for the promotion the next year. So they're, you know, and then there's the stigma and there's everything else that goes along it, with it. So, you know, our goal is really to give folks a place to connect. Um, where they don't feel judged. We see that a lot in there where people say, hey, I just needed a place to feel judged. Many of them come and talk when an anniversary is coming up of a, a critical incident or a mass incident that they're struggling with and they have different vernacular for how they, the different words that they've chosen to use instead of anniversary, which seems like a celebration. Um, and it's, it's really positive. We're, you know, a young app and we're working to to grow and are incredibly um, thankful that FirstNet has kind of done so much to help us promote and get the word out um, to responders. And this is really something that is built for responders. It's, you know, really first of its kind other than some of the Reddit rooms. So we really welcome any feedback. Please do email me. Um, we're working daily to pr provide enhancements. The, there's no data sold in the app. Um, there's no ads in the app. We will now and again promote different resources that we might find are available or would be useful. Um, but we really are informed by the responder community um, and supported through funding of our donors for All Clear Foundation for this program. So please, um, please do reach out if you choose to use the app. Um, we make enhancements about once a month based on user feedback, um, and the app will get better and better as we get more and more users in there. So here's some, you know, the, the end, the highlight reel here, just knowing that folks can chat openly and anonymously 24-7 with their responder peers. You can go, obviously, to the FirstNet app catalog to download it. You can go to responderrelate.com to learn more about the app. And I also welcome you to go to allclearfoundation.org uh, to, to take a look at some of the other resources we have available for responders as well, which as now I pass it off to Rhonda Kelly and she'll share the You Responder Strong um, wellness tool that's really a personal empowerment resource that is so powerful for emergency responders. So Rhonda, handing it off to you. Thank you so much, Janelle. I really appreciate it. Uh, and I, oh, I very much appreciate the opportunity to present today. So thanks to Anna and everybody at FirstNet. I'm Rhonda Kelly. Just to give you a brief synopsis of my background and how I came to be where I am now, I started an emergency response back in 1996, so last century, but still a baby when compared to, to those who've had 34-year careers with uh, LAPD. I started in the Antarctic as a remote pro, uh, practice EMT, transitioned to Colorado where I served as a volunteer EMT while also working for a paid company, transitioned into the fire service serving 17 years as a firefighter paramedic while working on the side as an emergency room nurse and a psych emergency room nurse. I became very interested throughout both of those careers in the ways that I was seeing our emergency response professions failing to support responders across branches in manifesting and maintaining good solid mental health not tying it in with performance in fact um, not recognizing that the single greatest exposure any of us whether it's law enforcement fire ems or dispatch has over the course of our career is the exposure to the intense trauma and suffering of other people in the complete absence of any preparatory training, any acknowledgement, any way to recognize this impact or to protect ourselves from it. And we all know if you're in this audience, we've paid dearly for that. Responders have paid for their service, not only with the longevity of their life, but also in the quality. Between the day that we first come on the job and we're green, but happy, 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 and thrilled to be there, thrilled to be able to help others, and the point when we're thinking about suicide, suicidal ideation, there's a lot of room for suffering. We know that that is taken up by things like depression, anxiety, substance misuse, and it's just not right. I became very interested in this, and out of that, um, realization grew an organization called Responder Strong. It's a collaborative initiative amongst all branches, so law enforcement, fire, EMS, dispatch, and all of their subsidiaries, whether it's crime scene investigator, coroner's personnel, the list goes on. Working together with our advocates, particularly educators, clinicians, researchers, and foundations like All Clear Foundation, 
working towards the mission of improving mental health supports, not only for responders, but for the responders' families. We know that families wear the invisible uniform. And many times, despite our best efforts as responders, we inadvertently take the trauma and the stressors of our work home with us, having a negative impact on our families. We know that if we really want to change the way that our culture views, the way that we, we are exposed and impacted by our work, we, act, we absolutely have to include the families in our approaches. Ah, there we go, sorry, pause there, my slides weren't advancing. So anyway, Responder Strong was created in 2016 with a focus on mental health. We took a targeted approach then, knowing that the stigma against reaching out for help when suffering internally, emotionally, or mentally was so great that if we didn't take tackle it head on, we risked missing the mark and not changing our culture, not providing culturally acceptable supports. We know that all of the cultures amongst the emergency response world and um, view any admission traditionally of mental or emotional impact from the job as a sign of weakness. And what a tremendous barrier that is. We all need a sense of belonging. We all want to feel like we're pulling our weight in the job and to be ostracized because we're the one who's suffering from stigmatized conditions like depression, anxiety, or substance abuse is worse than death for us. And we see it reflected in the numbers of responders who chose to go to their death rather than break that stigma and reach out and ask for help. So one of the things that we realized over time as we evolved is that in particular this year, 2020, when we look at the list of challenges that have been brought forth, COVID-19, the global economy being ruined, record unemployment numbers, the near complete disruption of our social systems and lifestyle. When we talk about that, it's ironic, isn't it, that in this year of greatest demand and personal challenge for emergency responders and for their agencies, we are functioning in a world that has, by its reaction, necessary reaction to the COVID pandemic, stripped us of many of our self-care practices, many of our resilience practices. And for many of us, we didn't recognize that what was happening. We don't have access to sporting events. Um, time going out with friends, bars, socializing, very limited. Um, no access to gyms for months, no vacations, no family gatherings, no celebrations. Um, for those of us who have retired during this window, no chamois, no gold watches, no big parties and send offs. It has really impacted us that we're being required to perform at the highest level we've ever performed in the absence of a lot of our self-care practices. When we talk about the added, um, the added stressors of the widespread social unrest right now. Um, we talk about fear and uncertainty, and that's been one of the big hallmarks of this year. Fear and then grief has been its, its counterpart, the other side of the proverbial coin. We're all grieving the loss of the lifestyle that we had, the things that we thought were stable and certain, and now we're in this world that's new and we're not quite certain where we're going. We have anticipatory grief. How long are we going to have to wear masks? We hear so many people talking about, I can't wait until we get back to normal, or more accurately, I can't wait until we get to the new normal. And then I believe most of us who are paying attention have that question in the back of our minds, is this the new normal? We don't know. And uncertainty isn't something that responders have traditionally dealt well with. We like to come in, survey the scene, and take charge, resolve it, solve the problems. And it's been a very, very challenging time for us on that level. Um, talking about isolation and social distancing, we know that one of our key factors as humans to maintain health, not only the mental, but the physical, the emotional, the spiritual, the physical, is to have social connection. It's one of our basic human needs. I really appreciate the work. You may have heard of him, Lawrence Levy, former head of Pixar's, um, or he was former CFO for Pixar. He achieved great fame with Pixar, turning it around from the struggling filmmaker it was in the late 90s into the behemoth that it is today. When he achieved that fame and realized he was at the pinnacle of success in Silicon Valley, he recognized internally he felt worse than he ever had. When he took a little time to self-reflect, he realized the reason for that was that he had neglected all of his basic human needs in pursuit of this success. He was working 24 seven, he was very isolated. He wasn't taking vacations, wasn't taking care of himself. He wasn't focusing on anything other than his work and he was paying for it internally. He made the decision to reevaluate whether or not he could continue to operate in the, the culture of Silicon Valley while meeting his basic human needs and avoiding what he ultimately realized was burnout. Um, so he, he actually chose to, to support his own basic human needs, which I think was a, an incredible choice. 
we know now for us, when we look at the, the psychological hallmarks of prior events, 9-11, MERS, SARS, anxiety, depression, and post-traumatic stress were what we were seeing. What we're seeing so far now, and researchers out of a lot of universities are watching, burn out, burnout is the hallmark psychological impact. That's where this tool evolved from. Janelle so eloquently phrased that we have this need for human connection. That is one of our basic human needs, and Responder Relate is able to provide that. But we also have a, magnitude, a multitude of other basic human needs, including physical well-being, playtime, peace, autonomy, meaning in our lives. And this tool was created to allow responders a private, a safe, confidential space to explore, to gauge themselves through a series of quizzes called reality checks. Where are they in each of these human needs? Which ones are they really jamming on and killing? Which ones could they really use some benefit in? You know, many times when our, the busy, hectic pace of our lives, we know something's wrong, but we have a challenge to try and figure out what that something is and how to address it. This is you, Responder Strong. This is the login page. Um, we know that, uh, and Mike touched on this earlier, responders are, by their very nature, suspicious. This is a confidential tool. We get so many questions. If it's confidential, why do I need to add, add my email? It's to allow individuals to create an account that allows them to save their content, including their self quizzes that are pr private to them, to save content that they want to refer to later. And the system becomes self-navigating. As each user works themselves into the system, the system recognizes what content interests the user and pulls content tagged with those, those topics to the top of their feed, allowing them access to a wide range, thousands of pieces of information without inundating them to the point that they can no longer function or navigate it. The content here is divided into three domains, succeed, thrive, and matter. Succeed is educational and promotional success, financial success, retirement, these sorts of things. These subgroups were devised by responders meeting and focus groups. What are our issues? What are we focused on? Thrive is all the things. This is physical health. It's nutrition. It's sleep. It's hydration. It's anger management, trauma, stress, anxiety, um, cardiac health all of the things that are adversely or stand the potential to be adversely impacted in emergency response work. And then matter. This is the existential piece and actually my favorite because we see that in those last stages of the stress injury continuum where responders are contemplating taking their own life, where they're actually taking the action to commit suicide, what we see is a loss of hope of meaning, of purpose, of connection, um, the existential questions. Why did the drunk survive the car crash and the family of four died? These are the crux of a lot of our issues as responders, but it's not something that we're really well educated on. We're not really guided to during the course of our career. So this tool makes accessing this content very, very easy. It, as Janelle mentioned, it is a browser-based tool it is mobily responsive when it's opened on a tablet or on a laptop, it looks and operates like a website. When it's opened on a mobile device, it looks and operates like an app. Icons, big colorful screens, current events, tips and advice, trending topics are on the side. With the heart shape on any of these pieces, you can save something for yourself to reference later. You can set personal goals. We have stories, personal testimonials embedded throughout. We all know that responders tend to listen to other responders. We've got some amazing personal testimonials for how responders have survived and thrived in their careers. This tool is available either through the responderstrong.org site or the u.responderstrong.org site. Um, you can also access it through All Clear Foundation. In January, I'm very delighted that we moved Responder Strong into All, Cl all Clear as a force multiplication between our collaborations. And now we are no longer isolating the mental health component to itself. We're embedding it in the overall holistic approach to responder well-being in recognition that for the responders to succeed and to be healthy and happy through a career and a long retirement, all of these domains are important. And in particular, the family is important. This tool is available free to all emergency responders, all healthcare workers, and to their family members. Again, in recognition that responders can't thrive unless their family is also thriving. So it's a great tool. Please check it out. We are delighted through the support of the Anschutz Foundation and Global Medical Response. In addition to All Clear Foundation, it is free and will remain free to all of these populations across the country. Thanks very much. Turning it back over to you, Miss Martha. <laughs> Thank you so much. I cannot believe how extraordinary uh, this is, truly. Uh, 
I would say it's timely, but it's past due. And I think having the network like FirstNet there to facilitate, and of course the team at FirstNet that's uh, truly leaning into the whole idea of embracing first responder wellness is is just so critical at this uh, at this particular time. We we actually just had a uh, a suicide in our my jurisdiction within the last three weeks. So it's it's it hits everybody right right in the uh, in the heart and the core of of who we are and what we do. Uh, it's very frustrating when we feel like we can't save our own. So thank you very, very much for everything that you guys are doing. So Mike, I'm gonna, I'm gonna start with you today with the Q&A. <laughs> and if you wouldn't mind, could you just give us a super high level uh, overview of the FirstNet network in general? Uh, how did we get here? Uh, what is the mission and vision and goals for FirstNet? Uh, go ahead and lay out just a quick roadmap on that one for us. Well, first of all, we in public safety fought for this for since 2012, and um, we fought for our own network, our own spectrum to the federal government, and we got it through the first net authority that's run by the U.S. federal government. AT&T is actually the contractor with a 25-year contract with the first net authority to build our network and to build it out for the next 25 years, whatever that takes to keep it running, you know, moving through 5G, 6G, 7G, you know, wherever we go with technology. And what I love about this both, it's the fifth national cellular network. We are not AT&T, we're FirstNet. We just happen to be contractors working for, uh, or under contract inside AT&T to build the FirstNet network. There's so many people out there in the commercial market trying to confuse the message by saying, well, we have a public safety network too. No, they don't. They're all just like AT&T, they have a commercial network, they don't have priority and preemption, they can't do any of the things they say they're gonna do. And I know this because I spent 15 years in technology and LAPD being lied to by technology companies, so I know the difference. <laughs> and it's unfortunate, but it's just the reality of what's happening. You know, it happened in the land mobile radio space and now it's happening in the commercial uh, spectrum space. There's only one first net. There's only one public safety network. It's first net and it's our own network. And the key part of this that's now coming to light for a lot of people is we have an ecosystem. It's not Apple's ecosystem and it's not Android's ecosystem. It's ours. It belongs to the first net authority. So you're beginning to see things like this capability that's going to come onto our network available to public safety that we're going to control. So in the very near future, you're gonna start seeing more and more applications where companies will no longer be able to try to sell us commercial networks or commercial technology. It'll be public safety technology built specific for public safety with the kind of security we need on our network that doesn't exist on a commercial network and all of those things. And so we're coming a really long way. We're up to about 1.5 million users on the first net network. We have the fastest, network with the most throughput anywhere in the United States, by far. It's much faster and much more capable even than AT&T's network, which our CEO was actually bragging about last week with all the reports to the stock market. It's interesting that he's bragging that our network's better, but I'm glad he did it. And um, so we've come a long way. We fought for this for a really long time. And I just ask all of you in the public safety space out there, if you have questions, my information is going to be available. Please call and ask. Don't fall for the lies. It costs you so much money to be lied to. I spent hundreds of millions of dollars in LA on junk. So buy the real thing. It's spoken like a, a true first responder. <laughs> I love it. All right, let's go back a little bit to the topic at hand. And uh, Mike, again, I'm going to stick with you for a couple of questions. Uh, and speaking about the North Hollywood shootout, can you give us a little glimpse into how things may have been different if these uh, particular tools were available for the first responders at the time of the shooting? Well, the first thing is in large organizations in particular, when there's a shooting review process, believe me, the officers are terrified wondering what our organizations are going to do to them when all they were doing was defending their life or someone else's life. It's just part of the reality of public safety. Especially today, can you imagine? You could be out of the riot in the streets of one of our major cities and you can get prosecuted for doing the job they sent you out there and told you to do. That's unfortunately where we are in public safety today. And inside a normal organization, they have 
behavioral science services and those kinds of things. No one trusts that, you know, because we don't believe it's anonymous and we've proven it's not because sometimes information gets out of what happens when someone meets with an internal psychologist. And when that happens, it just destroys the whole system. So in the North Hollywood shooting, this was classic. We had officers firing thousands of rounds they knew were out of policy, but they didn't care. They were trying to save their brother officers from being killed by crazy people, you know, they were, they were unarmed and they were just firing everything they had as fast as they could at those people in every direction from wherever they were at. Some officers were as far as 1,500 feet away and, you know, they're not going to hit anything with a 38 or a 9 millimeter Beretta, but they had to try. They had to do something to defend it. So wouldn't it have, what, what would have been different was had this capability been available to them, they could have gotten a hold of a peer-to-peer -peer person who'd been involved in a shooting somewhere, either in the LAPD, the LA Sheriff's Department, San Francisco, it doesn't matter where, and say, how do I prepare myself for all this stress? I know they're coming after me. And they're not talking about the bad guys, they're talking about internal within the organization or the politics of the news media. They're talking about everybody else who's coming after them for doing the job that they were hired to do. So I honestly believe a lot, we would not have lost a lot of those officers had they had somewhere to go that they really felt would be anonymous and they could have talked it through with other officers who'd been involved in shootings and realized you can come out on the other side. You still can be a police officer to be really, really good at it. And so for me, that's that would have been the most exciting difference was to not, we didn't lose them to physical injury. We lost them to psychological injury. And that's more tragic to me. Because um, that's well, a and, and think, problem, right? And I think you bring up a very interesting point that that those of us who have worked in that first responder space, uh, we clearly recognize that not only is responding stressful in its own right, no matter how much training we have, uh, people really underestimate that compounding stress and and the the things that follow in the wake of these types of of incidences that are even above and beyond just trying to deal with the PTSD of the event itself. So uh, it's it's extremely important that people recognize that we, we see those things. We see you and we see the, the stresses that first responders are under above and beyond uh, just what happens in that immediate moment. So, so thank you for that. So one last really quick question, Mike, looking at uh, these types of services, is it practical in a day-to-day situation as well above and beyond just the immediate hair raising <laughs> responses that trip these types yeah. of things you just look at the list of things that Rhonda and Janelle were talking about and the pressures forget just every single one of us right now today are isolated at home we can't socialize we can't go to church we can't sing we can't pray we you know we got all these restrictions coming on us from every direction of life by people who are trying to control every little bit of our life, compound that to what's happening to police officers, firefighters, nurses, this out in the middle of this chaos every single day. They're trying to burn down cities. They're trying to burn down government. Our government leaders are cheering them on for doing it. Just think of the amount of stress that I can't even imagine being in any of those positions today. I'm not sure I would handle it well. And <laughs> I'm just, I don't know. I don't even know any better way to describe it than thank God for people like Rhonda and and Janelle and everybody else who's working in this field because it, it's going to get way worse before it gets better. I, I think they said I saw a, a news program the other day where they said 25 percent of teenagers have considered suicide since the pandemic. Twenty five percent. So we know that's not going to get better because people are talking about isolating us more, wearing masks, staying at home for five years. There's all kinds of nonsense going on, you know? And right. that creates no sense of stability or future for a lot of people. And that creates a lot of stress. It does for me. And yeah, I'm absolutely. I'm tired of working in another job and I actually, you know, for the most part, have been through a lot. So a lot of things don't surprise me anymore, but this really surprises me. And this is a pretty scary time. Yeah, so you're really talking about not only the acute situations, but these sustained types of conditions that can just wear on individuals day in and, and day out. So Mike, thank you very much for your insights. I truly do appreciate it. I'm going to shift over to Janelle for a couple of questions. We did have some questions come in during your presentation. Uh, I know that Rhonda addressed this for uh, her application, but is your service free to first responders? Ah. 
great question. It is currently subscription free. We've had really fantastic and generous donors who have contributed in order to support responders during the additional stressors of COVID-19. So when we launched widely in April, we were able to keep it subscription free. In the future, the plan is for it to be 99 cents per month, which will fund development, uh, customer service, paying Apple and Google. Thank you, FirstNet, for being free. They are not. <laughs> and so they're um, in the absence of selling data or selling ad space, which we do will not do, um, there will be uh, a nominal charge. It also helps to keep trolls out. We don't find that people pay to go and troll. Um, so we that's an amount that we felt and we focus group that tested that that um, would be reasonable. But if we can find additional donors that are willing to support it, we'll, we'll keep it free as long as we possibly can. Well, and I love how you framed that because sometimes to the casual onlooker, when things are, you know, have a fee associated with them, uh, they feel like someone's trying to make a profit off of them, but it really feels like you are sincerely reinvesting that money and you're also putting right. these things in place to protect their own security. And I think the data mining is like bar none, one of the most critical as we are all so sick and tired of having all of our information uh, right. extracted from these apps and then shared with, uh, you know, God only knows who, right? So thank you for that. I really yeah. do appreciate yeah. it. Um, so and another it's a uh, question. Oh, go ahead. Just one follow-up that, uh, you know, as a nonprofit, we are obviously not here. Well, we want to make money so that, that way we can reinvest and, and do additional, you know, programs. Um, but yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's a little different as a nonprofit. And I think everybody, you're right, is used to the Facebooks of the world where it's free, but man, it is not free. Um, but some of the it's data we will look at, <laughs> but we, we will look at some of the aggregated data, um, which I, I've uh, failed to mention earlier, um, and looking at some of those conversations about what people talk about when they're anonymous at a very high aggregated level to help inform other responder groups, other folks working to to help responders um, and give them some of that additional data, including AT&T FirstNet, who's very interested in having that influence their programs as well. So there's additional value to the community there. But that's a metadata evaluation. Absolutely. Clearly. Okay, yeah, clearly. Absolutely. Okay, great, super. So this is a really fantastic question that came in. Uh, a lot of these FirstNet phones are being issued by agencies. Uh, how do you uh, assure that anonymity when they are, you know, sending notes and so forth in across your application on potentially a agency issued device? Wow, that's, can, can I have an easier question? Okay, well, um, so, I, I, I don't know what we can actually, if you, if you want to give a more complex answer, we can certainly answer this one in writing, um, but if, if there's a high level uh, answer, then no, it, from a it high level, goes to your anonymous, yeah. So from a high level version, I know that folks have agency issued phones, but you don't have to log in from an agency issued phone. If you prefer to use your personal device, it's an app. Um, you can still log in whether, I, I believe, and Anna might have to help me on this, um, you know, to your FirstNet account and be able to download it on, on a personal device, or you can, um, you know, obviously, you know, do it on your own personal device through other app stores. But, but the general idea is that as long as you go into the app and use an anonymous name and don't provide any information that, you know, a partner or somebody else would be like, oh, I know that's Mike, um, then you're anonymous. So we are not giving any information back to agencies at all. In the future, there's an opportunity for agencies to have private rooms. Um, but even in that case, we are not giving any information back to those agencies. You can set up a private separate email if you want to log in and have your own username um, and would have a different access code. So I don't know if they're, how it works on those phones from a technology standpoint with, with other ways, but uh, Nothing that we're doing in the app would allow anybody to find out who you are. Which well, is a challenge I think you too, I will say. Oh. Yeah, and it's not, that's why it's not a crisis app, because since we don't know who you are, we can't send 911 to your house. Right. If something was no, going and, on in the crisis. I, I appreciate that. I think you did answer it. So um, thank you. I do appreciate that. Sure. So really quick, can you um, talk a little bit about when the All Clear Foundation was established? Sure. So we started our work in mid 2018 and then started doing a lot of research and talking to responders, Rhonda being one of them before Responder Strong uh, 
became affiliated with All Clear Foundation. She was actually one of our advisors, and we listened a lot to what they were doing and started building the programs in 2019. Um, we wanted to really make sure that we had something to offer responders before we went out publicly or started asking anybody from the general public for any funding to support responders because we know responders would be the first ones to call us out saying you're not doing anything for us yet. So we had to have something there. And so we actually launched uh, last October 28th. Okay, fantastic. Well, and clearly a much needed uh, service. So thank you again for that. Rhonda, we're on to you now. Uh, can you talk a little bit uh, about why self-care for first responders is deemed more essential now than ever before? There I am. Absolutely. So, and I think Mike expressed it eloquently with, uh, it's going to get way worse before it's anticipated to get better. And Martha, you yourself spoke about the prolonged nature of this event. As emergency responders, we are accustomed to hearing the tone go off, responding, mm -hmm. handling it in a few minutes to a few hours, and moving on to the next situation. That's definitely not the case with this year. This I've heard it explained in so many different sporting analogies. It's not a sprint, it's a marathon. Well, it's a triathlon. Well, it's an ultra marathon. And I think so far we've run out of sports analogies, but we know that it makes self-care even more essential now. We can't wait until the end of the event. We can't say, oh, it's just gonna be a few days. Even in the case of hurricane deployments or wildland deployments, it's just gonna be a few weeks I can make it. This is the long game. Um, and we now have not only the occupational stressors, as Mike indicated, but we have the social, the economic stressors. We have um, the rules of engagement have changed for us as responders across the board, particularly for law enforcement. Social perception has changed. So we are in an incredibly destabilizing time. And it really goes back to that adage that you know the only thing we can control is how we respond. And we respond better when we're taking care of ourselves. So uh, you, to speak to what you just said, I think it's so salient, right? To be able to uh, reach out for this help in the middle of these events, right? I mean, because sometimes there are these sustained efforts, uh, clearly having one operational period after another, after another, uh, and you're right. Some folks will be like, well, when this is over, I can do dot, dot, dot. And the truth of the matter is, uh, and Mike alluded to this as well, is being able to, uh, reach out for that help in the throes, not only will have a sustained benefit, but will also have an acute benefit going back to the line, right? And doing what needs to be done at that immediate moment. So uh, truly remarkable that these things are in the palm of, of the first responders hand and, and able to uh, give them what they need in this anonymous uh, fashion. So I, I'm just truly uh, thrilled with what you guys are doing. So. Uh, and I know you touched on this in your presentation, but can you talk a little bit more about the benefits to responders and their families? Because clearly there's always a cascading impact of, of folks that are uh, having these sorts of problems and issues. Absolutely. And in particular with that, when we talk about the wide social scale of all of these stressors, it's not just the responders being impacted, it is their families. Their families are under significant duress now that they hadn't been prior, in particular with law enforcement. We've heard a lot of officers' families saying, we don't want you to do this anymore. We're, we're fearful for your safety. In the greater context of COVID, we're hearing from responders, families across the country, we're fearful you're going to be exposed in the course of your work, you're going to get sick, or you're not going to get sick, but you're going to bring it home and one of us is going to get sick or die. We are fearful. There is this compounded fear, layers of things that go well beyond the personal danger that we'd, we'd become accustomed to or inured to in the past. These are taking its toll on its families. When we look in the home unit now, how many kids across the country of responders and others are now facing homeschooling essentially, working um, from home. How are the parents going to juggle that with shift schedules? I mean, it's the family is deeply intertwined and the increasing stress levels of responders. And what we do with this tool, the Responder Strong tool, is not only do we have specific content for responders talking about parasympathetic nervous system backlash and recovery, talking about shifting worldviews and how the things that we are rewarded for at work, the behaviors and the thought patterns, don't necessarily translate well into our personal lives and how those can in, inadvertently create problems for us. So we've got responder specific content but all of the content also targets the human behind the badge and the uniform. So it is relevant to the human who is coming in to do this work. It's also relevant to the humans who are in their family unit. It gives them an opportunity to have talking points with family, to better understand one another, to connect in times of stress. And the other thing I really like about this is it's not only relegated to individual users, 
we've been actively encouraging agencies who lack their own internal wellness program or the funding or the, the expertise to create it to use this framework, this structure, this content to throw up a wellness system to better support their personnel in the workplace on the fly. Yeah, thank you so much. You know, what you were just talking about, it really reminds me of when my husband, who was a firefighter, before he'd leave the station, he would take his station uniform off and his boots off and he would put on his street clothes to come home so he wouldn't contaminate the family. But the truth of the matter is, we don't check our brains at the door, right? We bring this stuff in all the time. And it's so critical to recognize that there's no separating that, no matter how hard you try. I think trying to separate it is more of an oppressive tool than anything. So very quickly, uh, maybe in a minute or less, can you talk a little bit about the domains of succeed, thrive, and matter? Because I thought those were really interesting. Oh, fantastic. Thank you. So I did touch on them briefly in the, the um, presentation. We spoke about we want to have a tremendous amount of content available that is organized in a way that is operational for responders. So we have the self-navigation system as a user creates an account, the system recognizes what interests the user to bring that to the surface. But we really want to ingrain and instill in responders and their agencies that it's no longer piecemeal. You can't just take care of your heart. You can't just take care of your muscles. You can't just eat right. This is the whole package. Everything is interwoven. If you want to have a long, healthy career and then follow it with a long, healthy retirement, you need to take care of this stuff all the time. It doesn't need to be a challenge. We've got the info for you. There are easy ways to implement it. And one of the things that I really like when we first created our peer support team on Aurora Fire, where I came from, a fellow firefighter stopped me one day and he said, we stop counseling me and just give me the tools to fix this. I know something's <laughs> wrong. And this is what this is. And it's one of the things I love about All Clear Foundation is they're producing tools because we are a population who may not want to be therapized. We want to take control, just empower us, give us the skill sets we need, and we'll run with it. That sounds very typical for a first responder. <laughs> Absolutely, thank you very much. Anna, I'm gonna close with you today. Uh, can you talk a little bit about, uh, from the FirstNet AT&T perspective, uh, how do you feel that uh, the peer chat is gonna be helpful for first responders? Oh, absolutely. And so I'm going to answer that in a little bit of a roundabout way with a philosophical where I come from perspective and, and how I see this chat app. So in the beginning of my career with uh, the U.S. Army, we were entering the global war on terrorism. And the general officer I was working for at that time said to me, Anna, I want us to come out of this stronger than what we went in. I can't stop that bad things are going to happen. Tragedy is going to occur. People are going to die. But there's got to be a way to approach this from a health and wellness perspective that we can come out of this stronger. And I think whether you're looking at Responder Relate or if you're looking at Responder Strong, the, the backline philosophy is very similar. We know the bad things happen in public safety. We can't necessarily control that those bad things are going to happen. But there are things that we can do to make ourselves stronger to come out of the experience with more purpose, with more meaning, with a better understanding of what, it, what we experienced as individuals. And so that's what I think the value of the, having that peer-to-peer -peer connection, especially in a digital environment with how separated we are right now with the quarantine. So that's my goal, whether you're talking about the applications or where AT&T and FirstNet are going with the health and wellness program is really facilitating that how do we come out of here stronger than where we started? Great, thank you. Hey, I'm gonna ask you a, a broader reaching uh, question philosophically as far as the FirstNet AT&T effort. Uh, can you just tell me a little bit about why FirstNet AT&T is leaning into the whole wellness conundrum within that public safety space? Absolutely, and I'm, I'm honored that you asked me that question and thrilled to talk <laughs> about it because it really speaks to the value system of AT&T. One of our value uh, statements is to be there. And we've adopted that with First Responder Health and Wellness, that it is our intent to be there, to be a partner. Because I think what, what AT&T began to realize, even as they built out this beautiful network, you know, this incredible standalone wireless broadband network that was just for first responders, there was this coming realization that we can build all the fiber in the world but it's really the people that are the heart of it. And so part of that grew into this idea that, well, how do we become, how do we, how do we be there for first responders? Because if we take care of the people, 
they're going to better be able to do their jobs. They're going to better be able to utilize this beautiful network that they built. And so I see that their vision is to become partners in this. And I shouldn't just say them. I should say it's mine too, but it's my vision that we have to work with this and that we work together. And how do we as an organization support that at at and Fantastic. I, I'm so thrilled with every uh, stitch of information that you all brought to this webinar today. It really was fantastic. I, I can't thank you enough. And we truly do help, hope that everyone enjoyed the webinar today and felt that it was time well spent. Uh, we deeply appreciate your participation. Again, we are the Public Safety Broadband Technology Association, and we want to be your advocate for all aspects of FirstNet utilization. By being here today, you help support our efforts to continually bring you the cutting edge information about FirstNet, the nation's only fully dedicated mission critical first responders network and all aspects of the ecosystem that are being purpose built to your advantage, clearly uh, demonstrated today. Please visit us uh, on our webpage at thepsbta.org for more information on the association, our upcoming webinars, and recordings of all of our previous webinars. In appreciation for your attendance today, you will receive a free membership to our association for 2020. Also, let your friends and peers know that by attending one of our webinars, it includes a free membership to the PSBTA, which is a $75 value, as a gift from us while we're all trying to navigate our current situation dealing with COVID. Finally, consider visiting allthingsfirstnet.com as well. Their team continually compiles valuable information on FirstNet and the developing ecosystem. This concludes our webinar on incorporating responder wellness into the FirstNet app ecosystem. Please join us next week on August 26th for our webinar on a look inside the governance of First Responders Network Authority, why the FirstNet Authority is built to protect the 4.9 gigahertz and apps that save first responder lives on August 27th. Thank you again for your time. Be safe.